Last week we were looking at, we, we've just got finished with 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19, where Peter urges these Christians who are being persecuted, he tells them to have the right attitude in their persecution. He tells them that in the persecution of Christians, God is beginning his judgment of humanity starting from the church. So he's telling, he's urging them they have to maintain this right attitude in the persecution of Christians. What is going on is God is beginning his judgment of humanity starting from the church. And the purpose of that judgment in terms of the church is to test it. You see that in verse 12 of chapter 4. You see that in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, very, very clearly that the testing is for uh, that the suffering is for testing purposes. The judgment is for testing purposes as is applied to the church so that the church, the true faithful may allow the genuineness and purity of their faith to come forth. Whereas the purpose of the judgment, when it later falls on unbelievers, will be to condemn and punish them. Now, he says, if it's difficult for the righteous, if it's difficult for Christians to be saved, we see that and we go, oh, that doesn't sound right. Well, it's difficult in what sense? In the sense that there is suffering to endure on the road to salvation, on the road to our eternal inheritance. He says, if it's difficult for Christians, for the righteous to be saved, one can only imagine the suffering that awaits the godless and the sinner in the judgment. See, if the saints suffer in this judgment, albeit for the positive purpose of testing, they still suffer. It's for a positive purpose, but they still suffer. And if that's true, if they suffer, how much more will the unbeliever suffer in the, in the judgment and punishment for his sin? So as Actemeyer uh, summarized the meaning of verse, uh, verse 17 in chapter 4, he says, The thrust of the verse is to warn Christians facing situations where denial of their faith could appear to alleviate their suffering. You can see where that is. That's the whole point of them being pressured so that they can think, well, if I deny Christ and bail on him, well, then I'll, that'll, that'll get me free of this suffering. And he, Actemeyer, he says that the, is to warn Christians facing situations where denial of their faith could appear to alleviate their suffering, that such denial will, in fact, only guarantee that their eventual end will involve suffering far worse than any they must now endure. So he's telling them, listen, that's that's not the way to go, <laughs> you see, because. If you're suffering now for this positive purpose of testing, the suffering that's going to fall on the unbeliever in the end, you can imagine that. So don't bail because you then will receive that. And so uh, I think that's the thrust. And right on the heels of that, right on the heels of that, he then says this. Therefore, I urge the elders among you, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a sharer in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is with you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, according to God, not with greed for material gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over the allotted ones, but being examples for the flock. And when the chief shepherd is revealed, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, younger ones be subject to the elders and everyone clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. See, because of the persecution these Christians are facing and the dreadful consequences of succumbing to the pressure of that persecution that he's just told them about. OK, they're facing persecution. If you succumb to it, if you give in to it, if you bail, you're then facing this much, much more dreadful suffering. So given those things in light of that, because of those things, he then says, he says, therefore, he, he then exhorts the elders to fulfill their leadership role because of these things, given the pressure they're facing, given the dreadful consequences of succumbing to that pressure, you as elders... You must fulfill your leadership role. OK, they must help the saints to maintain their trust in God and to continue to live faithful lives in the face of persecution by modeling trust in God and faithful living in their own lives. The flock has to see its leaders standing up to the pressure of the society. 
You see, here they are, they're getting beaten, they're getting discriminated against, they're facing all this pressure, and they have to see their leaders modeling their faithfulness, their strength, in the face of a culture that opposes them. So they have to see them standing for, they have to see them out front taking the arrows, as we would say. You see, they're on the front lines. And the reason is, it's, it's one thing to sit from the position of an elder and say to people, you need to stand strong. You need to stand strong in the faith. It's one thing to say that, but that does little, if anything, to strengthen the people to do it. You see, when you do it, when you model it for them, it inspires them, it emboldens them, it encourages them, gives them the strength to stand as they say, see you out front in a culture that is hostile, being willing to stand firm yourself. For you to be willing to suffer in the name of Christ. Okay, so that is something that he said. That's this thing about modeling it for them. Telling them is good. Telling them is right. But you must live it and you must model it and you must be out front taking the arrows. Now, Peter himself, an elder, he refers to the sufferings of Christ and the glory in which Christians will participate at Christ's return. You see, he says... uh, a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings and a share in the glory that is going to be revealed. He, he speaks of Christ. He encourages them through Christ's example. Was he faithful through suffering? Indeed. Right? I mean, he, to the max. So he encourages them with Christ's example and with the eternal blessings that await the faithful. You see, what has he said all through here? Yes, I understand they're suffering a difficulty, but what is in store for the faithful? What is the end for the faithful? What is the tremendous blessing for the faithful? So he reminds them of that. And you see in chapter 1, verse 7 and 4, 13, makes clear that this uh, revelation and glory, these refer to the future coming of Christ. You see, when he comes in glory, when there is the consummation of the kingdom, when we enter into that eternal life, in the new heavens and new earth, and he commands them, to these elders, he says, look, shepherd the flock that is with them exercising oversight. They are to be concerned. They are to care for the well-being of the Christians in their congregations. That's their function. That's their role. They're to care for the well-being of the Christians in their congregations because you see there's a battle going on. And these people are being pressured and they have to overlook the sheep and help them and bless them. And to model these things for them. So they're to care for the welfare or the well-being of the Christians. And this requires them to be alert to, to circumstances and situations in the lives of the members. When elders seek to find out what's going on. You know, some people, they, they try to, they, they want to know, they need to know what is happening in your life, what's going on. You have people that, what do you want to know? Who are you? You the Gestapo? No, I, I'm an elder. Who's trying before God to fulfill his responsibility, which requires me to know about you. You know, I know cases people say, I'm going to call the police on you. I say, well, you know, I don't know what to say about that kind of stuff. Uh, but this is they, they need to know that. And so that's part of the, you know, understanding being in touch with the people. It's not to intrude. It is to bless. And we have to understand that and recognize it. He commands them there, he says, you know, shepherd it, take care of the well-being of the Christians. And they're to serve in this capacity, not under compulsion, but willingly, even eagerly, as he says at the end of the verse. Now, it's not always easy to discern the line between compulsion and encouragement. We're told to give not under compulsion. Yet we don't have any qualms about urging people to give, right? We don't say that when we encourage them to give and we teach them about giving and we say that, that somehow we're converting or we're, you know, hindering their ability to do so without compulsion. No, we're saying we're encouraging them. They're going to they're going to take all that in. And then ultimately they are to give on their own conviction. So that's how it is with, you know, when you're encouraging somebody who should be an elder. You're doing this in good faith, saying to them, hey. You know, this is something, you know, and then people take that in. So there's nothing wrong with that. Now, there, there could come a point where somebody is, is becoming an elder just because uh, he feels he has to. He feels that there's no other option for him not to do it. And the Shriner said those who serve only because they, they feel they must will lose their joy and the church will suffer as a consequence. 
Okay, so I'm all for encouraging people. To, look, I think that's good and right and holy and everything. But somebody who simply has no interest in not going to do it, who gets browbeaten into it and says, you know, you're a jerk if you don't do it. And then he winds up doing it. He didn't want to do it, has no interest in doing it. Well, then I think it ultimately can turn out bad. But where that line is, is hard to tell. Okay, and I just think the parallel is with giving. And as we, I say, we, we encourage one another to give, and I think that's right. Now, an elder should, serve from a motiv- should not serve from a motivation of greed for material gain, seeking the position as a means of, of getting rich. And we don't have that problem. We don't pay them anything. Right? We don't pay them anything. And I don't see the, I, I don't, I don't know how things work, but I, I doubt we haven't somebody go, well, I have access to money over here. But you can see in certain circumstances that could be an issue where somebody who thinks this is a ticket to getting rich. And so that, of course, is not a spiritual attitude. And, and so he tells them about that, look, not to serve for gain. Rather, he's to serve eagerly, meaning he's to serve because he wants to give of himself in that role. This is what he wants to serve in that role. And that is why I, I say many times we have to appreciate the men who serve as elders and not to look at them as though they're doing something to us. They are. They're serving us. You see, they're serving us and we need to let them know that we appreciate them. And I say, if you've ever done it, it's a hard job that carries a great deal of stress. And then to have people, you know, treat them like they're trying to do something to you, bums them out. See, and so the idea is that, well, their serving should be a joy. And I think it would go, go a long way in that if we would tell them, you know, I know this is an easy job and I love you and appreciate what you're doing. Thank you for being willing to do that. So he tells them, look, not for financial gain. Then he says, when Christ, the chief shepherd, returns, those who have served faithfully as under shepherds, he's the chief shepherd, they serve faithfully as under shepherd. They'll receive their share in the eternal glory of the consummated kingdom of God. So here's this Christ. The kingdom is a present reality. It's been inaugurated. But when Christ returns, it will be consummated, as I've said many times. And so when that happens, those who've served faithfully as under shepherds will take their share in that consummated kingdom. And it'll be well done, good and faithful servant. You see? Well done for being willing to serve in that capacity, to carry that burden because you love me and you love my people. OK, that's why he says it's, it's a noble thing to do that. Now, in, in the first part of verse five, he urges the younger members of the congregations to be subject to the elders. Now, people sometimes wonder, has he switched here? Is he speaking about this church office, which he clearly isn't? And all of a sudden he just talks about an old guy. I don't think so. I mean, the context is he's speaking about elders. So in the, in the first part of five, he urges the younger members of the congregation to be subject to the elders, presumably because they were in special need of that instruction. We think the idea that young people think they know more than older people is something new. It's not new. It's, you know, it seems to be an inherent part of being young. You see that you've got everything wired. And the, you know, the old heads, what do they know? You know, they just shuffle along and they got gray hair and all this kind of stuff. Whereas you're happening. You see, they wouldn't have used the term happening back then, but the spirit would have been there. Okay, and I think this is what he's telling them, especially Schreiner remarks in his commentary, says they should not be resisting the initiatives of leaders and complaining about the direction of the church. You see, as I've said many times, if you if you have some question like that. You need to talk to the elders, you see, the leaders, instead of going over and going, you know what, I can't believe he did that. He did that, that, that. Right? Now, what does that do? And people go, oh, that's just terrible. And they go over and talk to their, but why don't you just go talk to the, to the elders? You see, if you've got a beef, instead of setting people against them and poisoning them, and that doesn't just go for elders, that goes for anybody. Right. I mean, if I sit here and say, Merle, I can't believe Merle's moving actually makes me terribly angry. <laughs> you see, I mean, so so I mean, this idea works. And I just I, I think it's it's uh, it's important. Let me hear. Here's what the uh, Grudem says about it in his commentary he says 
The question remains why Peter spoke only to you that are younger and not to the whole church in commanding submission to the elders. Of course, there are places elsewhere that you see everybody's included. He says it's probably because the younger people were generally those who would most need a reminder to be submissive to authority within the church. This would not imply that the others were free to rebel against the elders, but quite the opposite. If those who are likely to be most independent minded and even at times rebellious against church leaders are commanded to be subject to the elders, then it follows that certainly everyone else must be subject to the elders as well. And so this is a thing I just think that, you know, partly because we're Americans, uh, the idea of submitting to leaders, even when we appoint them, we just there's something about it. And I think we need to understand that. Okay. now, does that mean you have elders sitting here saying, listen, whatever I say, I'm going to become God to you. Of course, you know, you're not talking about that. You're talking about men who are serving and trying their best to bless the flock. And we do all we can to cooperate with them in that. Okay, that is our call as sheep is we are to help them in in discharging their responsibility. And the second part of five, he urges all the saints to be humble toward one another. Okay, he says, and everyone clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Shriner says, humility is the oil that allows relationships within the church to run smoothly and lovingly. Pride gets upset when another does not follow our own suggestion. Isn't that right? I mean, you sit here and say, listen, I'm the smartest guy in the world. Nobody else has ever had a thought. And if everybody doesn't do everything the way I think and say, you know, I'm going to pout. I'm going to pout and talk about it. And it's just, see, it's just a prideful thing. Okay? You may be right, but you may be wrong. Okay? And so you just have to understand this is how life is, right? You know? Yeah, you, yeah. she said, who's in charge? So you have this idea. See, I think he's right about humility toward one another goes a long way in unity in a body of believers. In other words, if you don't just sit here and somebody say, well, he's got a different idea. Okay, well, he's worthless. You see, he's he's out. OK, you see what that does. It's divisive and winds up. It, it works against unity. All right. Pride gets upset when the person doesn't doesn't follow. As I said, now, Peter supports this admonition with a reference to Proverbs three thirty four. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. OK, he opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. All right. In chapter five, this is the the, the last lines. I hear that. Hear that cheer. He says in in chapter five, verse six, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your anxieties on him because it matters to him about you. Be sober, be alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in the faith. Knowing the same sufferings are being endured by your brotherhood in the world. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you've suffered a little, will himself prepare, establish, strengthen, and secure you. To him be the power forever. Amen. Okay, now here, here he, he says, look, given that God opposes the proud... But gives grace to the humble. That's why he says he quoted that proverb. And then he says, humble yourselves. Therefore, given what he's just said from that proverb, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Peter calls them to humble themselves under God's mighty hand, meaning they are to bow to God's right to bring his testing judgment on them in the form of suffering. That is what he's talking about here. And when he says, humble yourselves before his mighty hand. God has brought testing judgment on them. They're suffering. He wants them to endure that. He wants them to accept God's sovereignty in the matter without resenting or rebelling against him because he has chosen to allow them to suffer. It's like children, right? Sometimes we sit here and, you know, I just throw a fit. Why are you doing this? Why are you allowing this? I'm I'm tired of this. I'm not going to do this. And he's telling them, listen, humble yourselves, submit to his right to bring this testing judgment of suffering in your life without resenting it and without rebelling against him because of it. Nobody likes suffering. 
You know, that's not something. And nobody likes suffering. He understands that. But we are to humble ourselves before God's mighty hand in the face of it. They are to maintain this submissive spirit before the Almighty, he says, that he may exalt them in due time, that he may exalt them on the day of Christ's return. You be faithful through this suffering that God is allowing you to endure as testing to let your faith shine forth. You be faithful and great is your reward. Great is your reward. Here's what Schreiner says. He says, Peter was not promising vindication and exaltation in this life. Haven't you known people who've suffered? All through their lives, difficult times. He says he's not promising vindication and exaltation. It's like the point is not that such vindication occurs occasionally in this life. The time in view is the day of judgment and salvation. What Peter called the last time in Cairo Escato and in 1.5 or the day of visitation in Hemera Episcopace in 2.12. That the exaltation would occur on the last day fits with the eschatological, the end time focus in First Peter and draws us back into the orbit of the first verses of the letter. Chapter one, verses three through twelve, where the salvation envisioned is an end time salvation. So he's telling them, listen, you be faithful. You don't be bullied. You don't be scared off. You submit to before God in light of the suffering he's allowing you to endure. You hang on and be faithful. Great is your reward. He will exalt you in due time. You see? And we have to see that. And we have to hold to that. And we have to encourage people in that truth. Because it has great power for living in the here and now. You see, it has great power. Now, their humbling of themselves before God, this is to, this is to, uh, is to include their casting their anxieties on him. This is part of humbling yourself before God. This is humbling because it's an acknowledgement that one cannot solve the problems in one's own life in one's own power. Right? You are sitting here, humbled before God and casting your worries, casting your anxieties on him. How is that humbling? Because I'm saying to God, take it, I can't. So you are the sovereign one. Here, take this from me. Shriner says, when believers throw their worries upon God, they express their trust in his mighty hand, acknowledging that he is Lord and sovereign over all of life. You see how this is a humbling here. They're to cast their anxieties on God because he cares about them. God cares about us. Now, when you're in the vice, when you're being pounded, when you're in the storm, sometimes you doubt. Does he really care about me? How can he possibly care about me and allow me to suffer the way I'm suffering? Well, you know, you know, Job. You see, this is this is the point of Job. Right. He's doing something beyond your perception and you have to trust that he's doing it. And that's why I've said to you before, the cross of Christ shouts to you across the centuries, however bleak it looks, However much you may be tempted to doubt it, you hold like a mad dog to the truth. I am for you. You see, that thing says forever. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care who's talking to you about it. I am committed to you to the point of dying for you. Okay? So that's, that's he's telling them here. He said, look, cast your anxieties on him. Because he cares. He has compassion on his children and he will sustain them in every distress. Now, Peter here, he may be alluding to Psalm 55, 22, where in the context of anguish caused by opposition from the wicked, the psalmist there, he says, cast your burden in Hebrew. When they translate it into Greek, they had this word anxiety, cast your anxiety on the Lord and he will sustain you. And then Peter commands him in verse eight to be sober and alert, to be vigilant Because the devil is seeking to destroy their faith. Now, I've said before, you don't understand that. You don't believe that. You've been sucked into our materialistic perspective here that all we feed to people is that we came from nowhere out of nothing by chance. And if you can't eat it, it's not real. That there's no spiritual reality. Well, there's a spiritual reality and there is a war going on against a sophisticated enemy. Oh, no, he's here. That's why I say, you know, they got him here in, in red tights with little pitchforks. <laughs> Isn't he cute? He's not cute. He's deadly and smart, clever, wise in an unbiblical sense. You see, 
And he sits here and he tells them, look, he's after them. He's seeking to push them to apostasy through persecution. You see, he's giving them the hammer. Why? So they will not submit to God's under his mighty hand, to his right to bring this testing judgment on them. No, I'm going to rebel. I'm out, baby. I'm out. You see, that's what he wants. That's that's all he's after. The rest of it's just junk. What he wants for you to do is to turn loose of Jesus Christ. That's it. Everything else is a smokescreen, a diversion. He's after your faith and he's pushing these people through persecution, through discrimination, through abuse. So they wind up saying, this isn't worth it. I see all these other people. Life is going on. They're living. They're not getting the hammer. They're not being dragged into court. They're getting jobs. And I'm over getting nothing except abuse and discrimination. That's the enemy baby saying, drop it. Drop it. You're a fool. You're a fool to hold on to this. You're pie in the sky nonsense. Drop it. Drop it. There's nothing to it. It's not real. And we got all these voices saying, that's right, it's not real. We know, we know. You know, we just came out of nothing. Just chance shook out. Just shook out and we got earth and bumblebees and potatoes and whales. Just shook out. That's how it happened. And everybody sits there and goes, yeah. And you say, I think that's crazy. And they say, well, you're an idiot. But see, this is, this is the voice. Okay, he tells them, look, you have to stand strong here. The, the, your enemy, the devil, he's pushing them toward apostasy through persecution. See, he's seeking to strike fear in their hearts, as does the roar of a lion. But they're to resist that effort by standing firm in the faith. It may, you may be afraid. Okay, but you're to stand firm in the faith. As this lion is roaring, trying to scare you, to bluff you off of Christ, his master. You see, the one who's superior, the one who can bring you through, the one who can bless you, the one nobody can snatch you from his hand. You see, so he's after you that way and his encouragement to do so for them to stand firm in the faith in the face of persecution. He lets them know that Christians throughout the Greco-Roman world were enduring the same kind of discrimination and abuse. They were enduring suffering and standing firm in it. That helps us. Right? That helps us to see people stand firm in the faith when they're getting the hammer. You say, wow, that's what he was telling the elders. You can't retreat. You can't run back. You can't withdraw and sit here and tell yeah, you guys be firm in the faith. You have to be willing to suffer in the name of Christ. And then people see that and they go, okay, they're strengthened to do it. So he tells them about all the suffering that's going on in the Greco-Roman world. Of Christians facing the same kind of thing and standing firm. Now, he uses the word little here in this clause after you've suffered a little while. You see, it can mean that their suffering will be small in amount or small in duration. But either way you take it, Peter is speaking relatively. You see, he is speaking in comparison to the eternal glory that God has promised. Actemeyer says the oligon little may refer to quality as well as quantity, that is, compared to the glory to come, any suffering of whatever length is minor when seen from the perspective of that glory. Thomas Schreiner says, the sufferings of this life will seem as if they lasted a little while when compared to the eternal glory that endures forever. Karen Jobes, Peter is more likely saying here that in light of the eternal Ionian glory, which believers have in Christ a lifetime in this body, is but a little while. I mean, wasn't that Paul's perspective? Romans 8.18 and 2 Corinthians 4.17, he says in Romans 8.18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Now, this is in a text where he's talking about creation being remade. The resurrection. Life. There's going to be a glorious existence. And he sits here and says, I think that our... Now, I look at Paul's suffering, and Paul sits here, and he can say, listen, this is nothing in comparison to what's in store. But the world is trying to get you to say, focus here, focus here. This is all that matters right now, here and now, here and now, here and now. Do it, do it, do it, do it. Don't think about this. Don't think about the big picture, eternal glory. But what does Paul say? I'm suffering like a dog. But what's that compared to what's in store for me? You see, and if we lose that perspective, you see, this is not simply academic theology. That perspective 
has tremendous fortifying power for the here and now. Well, how is he appealing to them to stand firm in suffering? There is an eschatological focus to the entire letter. Why? Because you need to know that what you're enduring now in the name of Christ will be as nothing. Just like Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.17, Paul says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all compare." This light momentary affliction. They beat Paul all over the Mediterranean. And he says, this light momentary affliction. Well, what do you mean? It's not light and momentary. Well, not in an absolute sense. But when you look from the perspective of what is in store, he looks at that and says, trivial. Trivial. And that's what Peter's talking about. Now, regarding God's preparing, establishing, strengthening, and securing them. I think Actemeyer's correct when he says, the point of the future verbs here is that subsequent to the suffering, God will give the Christians an unshakable grounding by including them in his eschatological, his end time, consummated kingdom glory. Karen Job says, Peter uses four nearly synonymous verbs to describe what God himself will do for the benefit of faithful Christians after that little while of suffering has passed. Peter probably uses these four as a rhetorical crescendo to refer to the complete act of God at the consummation of all things. See, this is what I think this is the right way. This is the right understanding. Peter describes their eschatological exaltation. He will exalt you in due time. There is suffering to be endured. The judgment has broken out against humanity beginning with the church. There is suffering to be endured in route to your eternal inheritance. That suffering is there, and he describes that you will be exalted in due time. And he describes that eschatological exaltation in terms of God's preparing, establishing, strengthening, and securing them. Okay? These four words that are used, they have a wide range of meaning that overlap. Okay? I take them in the sense that I've just said to you. Preparing, establishing, strengthening, and securing. They will be equipped. They will be prepared. They will be made ready for life in eternal glory at the resurrection in that they will be immortalized. You see? They will be suited for eternal life. They will be made ready. They will be set firmly in that reality. They will be strengthened in the conviction of the gospel as their faith becomes sight And they will be set on the secure foundation of an unshakable reality and existence that is eternal. He is going to do that for them. And I think he phrases their eschatological exaltation this way. He describes it this way because I think this imagery would have great appeal for people who had been buffeted by persecution. People who had gotten something we know little about. Ken Fox, the only guy I know who's gone to jail for Christianity. I mean that. Only person I know. Now, I know that the, uh, the fellow down in Nigeria who was tortured recently by the Muslims, Jacob Achenefu, I know him. But here, here he's talking about, you know, when you've suffered persecution. See, he's writing to those whose doubts, weaknesses, fears... And insecurities have been magnified by the turmoil of suffering. And to those people... God promises he'll bring them home to an eternal dwelling for which they will be completely equipped, in which there will be no threats, and from which they cannot be moved. So here I'm in this turmoil, this suffering. He says, I'm going to take you. I'm going to establish you. If you're going to be set. Okay? That's the hope. That's the promise. Now you take that and you stand firm through whatever this world throws at you. And persecution got a lot worse. It got worse. It got brutal, it got physical, it got murderous. And he calls them to stand. A knowledge of this promise, it comforts, but it provides strength for them to endure whatever hardship the hostile culture may visit on us. And we have to have this with people. I get the sense sometimes that we just look, you don't want to talk about that. That's pie in the sky. That's all down the road. Who cares? We need to talk about here and now and doing here and now and doing here and now. You are taking from people. A tremendous spiritual resource for strength by draining eschatology from the New Testament. You can't do it. 
Okay, you cannot do that. We have to preach this, teach this, as it's in the Scripture. So it's, it's powerful, you see. It's not just, the, well, can we sit around and talk about, you know, uh, these esoteric matters? Can we do that? It has force and it has power. As I said many times, you have a number of people who say, look, this is the heart of New Testament theology. You see? But I think that we just, we've grown tired. Well, you know, it just doesn't seem like people are going to be interested in that. Because they don't know when it's happening. Well, tell them! (laughs) You see, it's happening. It's happening. And they need to hold on to that. Now, having spoken of God's plans for the faithfully in verse 11, he says, To him be the power forever. Amen. Who has the power to do what he has described, what he has alluded to, what he's taught them about? Who has the power to rescue creation from corruption? Who has the power to take you and establish you firmly in the new heavens and new earth? He does. And as he's talking about this, he just says to him be the power forever. No man can do this. No person can do this. No created being can do this. God can do this. And he's going to do it. Now, he finishes here, 12 through 14. He says, through Silvanus, the faithful brother, as I think I've written briefly to you, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you must stand. She who is in Babylon chosen with you greets you also does mark my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Now, in saying that through Silvanus, he's most likely saying that Silvanus was the one who was designated to carry the letter. And that's typically what this phrase would mean in, in the first century world. He offers a typical commendation of a person who's carrying a letter. And this person, Silvanus, this is uh, no doubt Silas. It's an, it's an alternate, a Latinized form of the name Silas, which was probably the Greek form of an Aramaic name. And we all know Silas. Silas is, uh, Luke says, he, he's Paul's partner in ministry. And Paul then refers to Silvanus. Okay, refers to Silvanus, who accomplished, uh, who accompanied him and him and Timothy in their travels in Asia Minor and Greece. Silvanus is named with Paul and Timothy in the opening of both letters uh, to the Thessalonians. So Silvanus, he's talking about, is Silas, and Peter identifies here the purpose of the, of the letter is encouraging them, and he, he, the purpose he says, I've written you briefly to you, encouraging you. And testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you must stand. He wants to encourage them to hold fast to Christ because that is the grace in which they stand. If they abandon Christ, they abandon the grace of God. Because the grace of God is in Christ. So as they're being pressured and persecuted and pushed to yield on Christ... He says, I'm encouraging you to stand firm because in standing in Christ, you are standing in the grace and mercy of God. And so he wants them to do that stand firm. Then he says here, uh, uh, she who is in Babylon chosen with you refers to the, the church in the locale from which Peter's writing, which I understand with the vast majority of scholars to be Rome. I think what he's doing here, why does he refer to it as Babylon? I think that conjures up images of the Babylonian dominion. You see, and he does that because it bookends with this opening reference to them as sojourners of the dispersion. So I think it's more rhetorical where he opens with this. You guys are sojourners in the dispersion, the scattered people who are citizens of heaven, but away living here. And then he ends it with this reference to Babylon because it fits with that. Okay, that's uh, my two cents on that. Now, Mark is John Mark, who accompanied Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. He's the author of the Gospel of Mark, which you have historically credible early tradition that says Mark received much of his information from Peter. Okay, so you have that and you have this connection here. Now, Paul in four places, Paul in four places, Romans 16, 16, 1 Corinthians 16, 20, 2 Corinthians 13, 12, 1 Thessalonians 5, 26. Four places he tells the saints to greet one another with a holy kiss. And here, Peter tells him, see, tells him to greet one another with a kiss of love. And what I want you to see is that neither of them say simply, greet one another with a kiss. Rather, they both specify the attitude behind the kiss. And I'm convinced that's the focus of the command, is the attitude. You see, given that kissing was a standard way of greeting, 
family and friends in both Greco-Roman and Jewish cultures in the first century. What's being commanded is not that they greet by kissing. That's assumed, but that when they greet by kissing, it not be duplicitous. That it not be unholy. That it not be unloving. You see, that they not have those attitudes towards the recipient as was done in the kiss that betrayed Christ. You see, that when you, kissing is understood, it is the cultural backdrop of what he's saying. He's saying, listen, when you kiss, as you're going to, because that's how you do it, you make sure that you not be duplicitous. That you have your kiss be a kiss of love. That your kiss be Holy, that it not be a way that you come up and you're coming up to somebody and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, you're really great. And you're sitting there thinking, I can't wait to gig this guy. You see, I can't wait. Think about this. Let me give you an example. If Miss Manners, I don't know if any of you know Miss Manners, but if Miss Manners, all right, if Miss Manners charged Americans to, quote, toast brides and grooms with sincerity, it would be missing the point to think that she was insisting on wedding toasts. You see, the practice of toasting newlyweds, that would be the unaddressed cultural backdrop, not the subject of the command. The subject of the command, what is being commanded, it should be understood this way. Given the practice of toasting that you're all about, given the practice of toasting, do not use it as an occasion for duplicity. You see, that's the sense here, because people sometimes say, well, why don't you kiss people? I know John Blake does. And that's fine with me. You see, but I don't feel obligated to do it. And the reason I don't feel obligated to do it, because I don't sit here and say, well, I don't like that part of the Bible. I don't. Th- I think what was being commanded was the attitude behind the assumed kissing. And if I thought he was saying kiss, if it just said kiss one another, I'd be kissing you. Aren't you thankful? Huh? Aren't you thankful? Okay. Now, Peter closes here with a prayer uh, for peace for all Christians. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. And let me end with this quote from Thomas Schreiner. He says, Believers in the Petrine churches were buffeted by trials and persecutions. The stress of life was significant. What believers need in such a situation is God's peace and strength. A peace that will enable them to stand, chapter 5, verse 12, amidst the pressures of the present evil age. Such peace will fortify believers so they can endure opposition and persevere to the end so that they will receive an eschatological reward. You see, we have to one another, strengthen one another. This culture is pulling and yanking and just saying, listen, from every angle. Telling everybody Christianity is just kind of an old school thought. It was nice while it lasted, but now we're so much brighter and all this kind of stuff. We know so much more. We're so much more sophisticated than all those stupid ancient philosophers kind of people. You see, so you have that angle. Then you have the idea of, look, you have the sin angle of saying, listen, if you drop this Christianity stuff, the door opens for you. It's sex, drugs and rock and roll, baby. You see, and so you have this bias that's built in for people wanting to say, hey, if I jettison this, then it's parte. You see, I don't like being under God and this idea. So you have that pull and then you have the society feeding it, saying, here you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no smart people think that's true. No, no, all the no, no, no. All the bright people understand that that's just, you know, that's passe. That's just stupid. Okay. now who's behind that? I'm telling you who's behind it. And you say, oh, I don't believe, you know, yeah, yeah. The enemy is behind it. That's what's going on. And we need to help one another stand strong in the face of a culture that rejects the truth of Jesus Christ. Next week, we'll start Second Peter, Lord willing. Thank you.